For the sake of all beings, wisdom, compassion, non-clinging awareness, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Are there any observations or discoveries or insights or questions? Yes. Noticed an, an aliveness around the question of meaning, uh, and it was triggered by the mind zooming to popular culture. Perhaps that's so. It's not the in-depth, um, clear seeing, looking of science and biology, but let's say in the film Avatar, where they had that phrase, "I see you." Mm. And Which was borrowed from a South Southern African tribe, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and even, not even though it's popular culture, in that moment I felt uh, this aliveness in the body of, I suppose it's movement, but it raises a question of, it's, it, is it meaning or it has juice? It's a quality I'm coming to appreciate as valuable. Um, and on the same line as that, I think as a segue or something I've wanted to understand more about, probably mixing cultures maybe might not be transposable, but the idea of offering too, in the sense of a lot of them make native traditional American cultures would offer tobacco or something like that. So I think there's a, at least it's not necessarily a question here, but um, one field of inquiry is around this meaning making or the juice, um, what that experience is when it when it happens. It doesn't seem to be, can't force that. And then um, seeing that these themes of seeing big eyes towards totality and then, and then making offering is something common that seems mm. throughout culture. Absolutely. Mm. I mean, uh, the... I think for many people when they approach this kind of expansive vision in whatever culture they're approaching it in, right, they're kind of, uh, we, we early on make a concept of totality or Atman or God or, or the Great Spirit or, or what have you, right? Um, and then we're trying to see this in beings, maybe as a training, right? And, uh, but as our practice matures, we begin to see that that way of expressing it is actually a not seeing. Because we're not interested in seeing a totality, we're interested in seeing you. And you just happen to require the whole of the totality. There's a, you know, or buffalo, or, or 
this person or that person. It's as I've often, I mean, I've done it for a long time now, so it's kind of as if this is how we think about things. But, but uh, it was a huge shift for me when I, when I suddenly turned the Brahma Vihara back to front, inside out. You know, and instead of looking for immeasurable love, I looked into this being with love and saw that they were immeasurable. And I began to see that the immeasurableness is in, in the particular form that I'm, or the particular being that I'm interested in. It's not somehow I got a kind of squint so that their particularity starts to dissolve into some vast interbeingness. Right? And so, you know, we, we conjure up the idea of God or something until eventually we begin to realize that every being that we meet is, is this present moment's expression of God. Um, and at which point we don't, have to, we don't have to conjure up God anymore. Right? This is how, and this is paralleled in the Tibetan sadhanas of, you know, you go through all this preparation and then you kind of generate this fantastic, extraordinary mandala of Buddhas and radiant beings and yourself in there and all kinds of wonderful exchanges of energy and offering and blessings and things like that. And then the, and then the whole thing dissolves into or expands into, depending on how you look at it, into a kind of a, a vast, um, oceanic, systemic, unpindownableness, <laughs> right? Um, however you want to describe it, right? And then, and then you know, it says, um, dwell in that for as long as is natural. And then you emerge in the form of this whole radiant being, right? Of whichever one, you know, it's generated your tar or this or that or the other, right? In your normal form, right? Um, and then a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I made this great effort and I went far out and then I come back to normality. As if somehow, you know, when it finally dissolves back into your normal, kind of relax the practice, you know, it's kind of good enough, Jamie's Chen Raisi, you know, it's like, um, you know, kind of, that's a nice thought to conclude on. But consider the possibility that this wasn't actually a depth understanding of this experience at all. And that, that in a sense, um, if I see something imbued with God, it, it, you know, I could in um, conventional language say that that was kind of more meaningful, right, than, than something that's not imbued with God. Right? I mean, I, we're back on this kind of very difficult and slippery idea of meaning. What does it mean? But just not trying to pin it down, but just the way we use it. Right? You could see that. And so, so imagine for a moment that you came to the point where everyone and everything that you meet is just profoundly, vastly meaningful. Why on earth would we need to conjure up some idea of God? Right? And we don't need to make offerings to God or make offerings to deities. We're just decent with each other <laughs> right? and actually live well. Right? And I, I think like the, the I imagine in my imagination, if I, if I think of a kind of an enlightened biosphere, right? I, I imagine a biosphere in which observers would find no trace of religion whatsoever. They would find no belief systems whatsoever, right? They would find only extraordinary, creative, constantly shifting experimental interbeingness in a process of evolving God knows what into being, right? The, the next phase of the universe, right? And it would be, in a sense, effortless because no one is doing it. Um, you know, I'm not doing it, you're not doing it, right? I mean, this is being kind of an awakened biosphere. So, so in this sense, like coming to see the, how can we, if I feel something's very meaningful, I give it more attention and more valuing than something I feel is meaningless. 
Okay? And so if somehow I could um, bring forth an expanding capacity to see more and more things and processes as meaningful, this would be a, a significant transformation of how I am in the universe, okay? uh, how I am chemically, you know, physiologically, emotionally, conceptually, <laughs> at every level of being. And this would have massive implications for the rest of the ecosystem right there. And so in a sense, like the, the essence of this first, um, you know, reverencing the infinite realm of awakening, uh, you know, which I pointed out yesterday, really rests on a kind of the, the way we understand what's being pointed at with the word Tathagata. Right? Essentially, right, to see beings as Tathagata, whether they're in cocoons, by the way, that's another translation of garba, cocoon, I like that. You know, because you have a sense of like, well, I have a sense of, of a, a place of transformation. You know, like, like the, the caterpillar spun the cocoon and then out of this is going to emerge the butterfly. And so the kind of, if you like, the, the caterpillar of biological process has spun the cocoon and out of this uh, emerges a radiant bodhisattva, right? In the, the Tathagata Garbha. Right? And, and, uh, and yet, you know, I mean, and therein is, is a lot of our problem, right? Because if you, like, I, I'm wondering about the first human beings who began to recognize that caterpillars and butterflies were actually the same species. <laughs> you know what I mean? You've got to follow it continuously all the time, day and night, to be convinced of this. And someone must have, someone must have really observed and seen this. Because otherwise, what, why would you suspect that, that a, a yellow and white and black striped worm, <laughs> right? <laughs> which seems to be a super duper devouring machine, is going to turn into this kind of extraordinary, ethereal, uh, golden yellow, orange winged angel, right? That flutters in the, in the sunlight, right? And, and so, um, you know, we say, we understand that actually they're not different. They're not separate, right? And so we can see that the, actually the world of, of uh, biological chemistry and, and evolving ecology, right, uh, which somehow spins a cocoon from which emerges a radiant bodhisattva, they're not separate. The kind of the bodhisattva nature or the Buddha nature is not a different creature than, than, than um, stomachs and blood vessels and circulation systems and mammalian lineages and, and, and uh, animal lineages and plant lineages and fungal lineages and the whole weaving of all these living systems, you know, out of this kind of inconceivable ocean of knowing, it's inconceivable for us because we, we only can conceive how a multi-celled, complex, integrated creature such as a human being can conceive. And so we try and imagine, well, you know, how does, the, how does a carbon atom conceive of, a, of a, an oxygen atom, right? So it sort of links up and becomes CO2, you know, <laughs> like, like a, as a kind of a permanent merger, right? Uh, a marriage, a relationship, right? And they're relating, and it's not permanent, actually, because it sort of hangs together. Sometimes they get a divorce, right? Sometimes other factors come in and smash up the relationship, right? There's, there's all kinds of, you know, you can make kind of metaphorical parallels, right? But for many people, we, we find this just an inconceivable jump. It's as if we have no recognition that there's anything like caterpillars and butterflies have anything whatsoever to do with each other. We say that silly, but then we turn around and say, well, bodily processes and physiology has nothing to do with consciousness. Uh, I mean, there, there, are, there are one or two inconsistencies in our ways of 
looking at things, right? But that this first one, if I see someone as Tathagata, right, as a kind of, essentially that is not seeing, wow, you're Tathagata. Actually, this is a very ordinary thing. It's just looking in, and I see, and I have an increasing conviction that everything I see, big, small, animate, inanimate, is an interbeing of myriad um, forms and processes. I'm seeing with eyes of interbeingness. I'm seeing with eyes of deep ecology, right? In the sense that ecology might be the observer seeing the interbeingness. Deep ecology is uh, the interbeingness uh, acknowledging and recognizing its own interbeingness. <laughs> Right? In that sense, it's like the, the ecologist isn't stepping back and studying the ecology of life. The ecology is part of the ecology which is being studied, which is what we're doing in our meditation. This is why I always saw the parallel between deep ecology and, and deep dharma practice. Because in contemplative practice, we're meditating on the universe, <laughs> right? which is giving rise to the sense of ourselves meditating on the universe, right? a similar thing. And, and rather than more shallow, like so you stand on the side and you watch and you just see the surface of things, here I'm deep into it, right? And it's kind of deep ecology. Right? So we have this kind of, um, we're training towards having this um, kind of deep inner confidence um, of, of interdependent living systems, right? I mean, we think about it, we study it, do we follow our interests, doesn't matter where, right? Some people can study it through biology and some people can study it through, through um, you know, traditions that don't have any knowledge of what we call biology at all, right? But they're all coming to this sense of, of interconnectedness, not objective, not ecology, but deep ecology. Because when I am deeply woven into the very fabric that I am reverencing, it matters what I do. If I'm an observer and I'm studying it out there, it doesn't matter what I do, right? Because what, what I do, you know, th th this is doing its thing and I'm over here, right? And so, you know, when I begin to see Tathagata, all of a sudden the question of how do I live becomes absolutely important. It's not just an add-on, it's, it's totally important, right? And so, you know, I mean, if you are, uh, you live by killing animals to eat their flesh, then, then you, you, you have to raise this question, right? When you realize that the animals that you're killing, I mean, in Buddhist analysis, we, we'd sort of analyze it quite differently than, than say, the way um, you know, um, indigenous people might have analyzed it, you know? But nevertheless, there's huge parallels here, you know? It's like, I'm, I'm, I depend on Brother Buffalo, right? And, and, uh, and you know, and so in a sense, I d and I depend on my mother, right? And so I have the same relationship in a sense, right, with, with this. And yet I'm killing this creature to eat it. So this is going to require that I make some kind of adjustments because I can't just kill and eat and not sort of like feel the repercussions of this because I'm killing myself, right? And so maybe I conjure up what we call, you know, we come in as anthropology, well, they have this kind of ritual of atonement and so on, and they make offerings to the buffalo spirit, ha <laughs> ha, you know, and it's a bit corny, right? And, and uh, um, you know, we looking at it from a completely different mind, but within that culture, right? They are maintaining a sense of meaningful, harmonious relationship within the cycle of living that they live in, 
right? And we have to do the same thing. We have to find a meaningful cycling of relationship within the living that we are experiencing. And that's a living of this culture, with this situation in the world, with, with uh, at a kind of, I mean, I think every, I suspect actually that every moment of the world could be called a crisis point. And, and, the, and the beings who are involved in that crisis say it's the ultimate crisis that's ever been. And so we are now in the ultimate crisis that's ever been, but I'm not so sh certain that that's something new, <laughs> right? And, and, uh, but it really feels like it, right? It's, it's kind of the perfect storm, as we say, right? Of just so many factors. It's like a collision between in human, in human form. It's an it's a absolute catastrophic clash of civilizations, not between sort of Christianity and Muslims or something like that, but between beings who have an intuitive sense of the interconnectedness and hence have a kind of flavoring of relationship with others which is characterized by love. Right? And beings who do not see the interconnectedness and have a flavoring of relationship between others, which is defining your turf, defending it, um, right? And the dominant kind of energy there, the dominant emotional energy is not love, it's hatred. Okay? And in a sense, like, these are, these are ways of knowing the world. These, this, this is meaningful to see the world this way, Jamie. I mean, meaningful to see the world as something you've got to be defended against and hate and so on. That, that's a kind of a system that makes sense within itself, except that, um, you know, my bets are that if I could possibly be, right, an observer over a million years, you know what I mean? And then I was going to say, oh, well, I'll, I'll test these two threads of being, right? And I'm kind of like, okay, you got the, the lovers going here, and you got the haters going here, right? And, and, and I'm running a TAB and taking bets on, um, you know, like, which one is going to go the furthest, right? And I'm betting that there's no sustainability in the hate of any duration that's meaningful at all. You don't create ecosystems out of that. It just doesn't work. It doesn't happen. Okay. And so, you know, in a sense, like, if I um, see these are two kind of, I'm making an incredibly black and white picture, but I, I think, you know, in the light of this kind of reverberations of our recent taste, right, with, with Christchurch, um, this is, I mean, it's meaningful, right? That we have this kind of, you know, if you're on the side that is beginning to, if you feel quickened by a sense of the vision of interconnectedness and Tathagata and Bodhisattva, and there's something there that's just, yes, you know, never mind your intellect and being able to understand Madhyamaka philosophy and all that. Just, that, just at a kind of, the level that I had when I first heard this at 20 years old, and my whole heart went, yes, this is it, right? I look back now and I go, well, I was really deluded, but I wasn't. There was like something there that was like really beautiful, right? In a kind of um, um, simple, naive, yet to be ramified and matured form, right? Um, and so you've got sort of on one hand, and the love and the compassion and the and the um, and the desire to mutually support and help, right, is there. And then you've got on the other hand, you know, the kind of collision with what is becoming increasingly looking like just absolute destroyers. You know, we destroy our social systems, right? By time. Donald Trump is finished with America, and by the time Brexit is finished with England, you know, the entire um, level of social structure that we call kind of social organization via V politics and, and civil services and so on is just going to be thrashed. I, it's hard for me to see 
this is a positive thing, and yet there's people who seem to be just absolutely keen on it, right? And so I'm, I'm just going to point out something which is just painfully obvious, right? Um, how, do we, how do we deal with the hatred? Right? I know. Um, I hate the hatred. <laughs> And the hatred goes, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> right? Now this is, this is really important when it comes to the next stage of the Bodhisattva, and I think it has lots to do with what you were raising, Juliana, yesterday. Right? It's like this question of kind of skillful action flowing forth from this intuitive vision, right? or from this intuition. Right? I like to put it that way because we can all have this intuition. We're not haggling over, you know, how matured it is or how strong it is or how consistent. There's a kind of an intuition of this, right? Um, and that is that I, I just know that, in a sense, um, I can't respond. The, I can't respond to this with hatred. I won't respond to this with hatred because it just doesn't fit into my picture of how on earth that could therefore help love um, win out, so to speak, if we're going to talk about, you know, some kind of competition. And so having recognized the interbeingness, then there comes the aspiration of training with this vision, right, to begin to step into a degree of action. And we come to the next section of the training, releasing into a vast flow of offering. Okay. Beautiful flowerings and networks of flowerings, easeful communication and the balm of healing presence, canopies of shelter and refuge, lamps of clear seeing and deep understanding, and the fragrance of love and wholesome relating, I offer to all beings who are awakening to or abiding as the flow of primordial, ever fresh awareness. In the actual traditional um, versions or translations of this uh, vow or aspiration or training, Right? It, it, it's very repetitive, you know, they say to all these victorious ones, and they're ta constantly talking about victorious ones or conquerors, or the language is one of like utter military, right? And, and so I, I must admit I had a struggle with that. I had to translate this into something different because it's like you're constantly using these military terms, right, to kind of, you know, we're, we're fighting for life and love. Uh, it's, in my mind it just goes, you know, it doesn't compute. For some people it computes, right? But it doesn't for me. Um, beautiful flowerings, right? This is, I've tried to put a dynamic on this. I mean, it said in the text it goes, offer flowers and, and incense and canopies and, and uh, perfumes and food and robes and stuff like that, you know, all these kind of traditional Buddhist offerings, but that's, they're actually symbolic of something. And because, you know, I, some things I can easily stop translating and just stay with the original symbol because it's juicy enough for me. But as Rinpoche once said to me, you know, when it was his birthday, it was the first day we arrived in New Zealand on October the 11th, his birthday in, I don't know, 1972 or something like that. Right? And he, uh, half of us had no money and half, half of the people in the group, maybe about a dozen people, had uh, tickets on the Oriano, which was the P&O flagship cruise liner, right, that was going from, from Auckland gradually back to Vancouver. And, that, and the rest of us were just going to be dumped here, right? And so, so we arrived, got off the boat, had no idea, I think I had 50 cents in my pocket, and, and uh, 
uh, Rinpoche said, okay, come along, and, and, and it's the only time I've seen him do it. He, he went into the travel agent, he went into the travel agent, and before he did so, he said, give me all your money and all your tickets. So, you know, someone gave a, their ticket on first class ticket on the Oriana, God knows how many thousands of dollars it was worth. I gave my 50 cents, <laughs> right? And, and everyone gave everything that they had. And he went in there and, and I sat down on the curb because there was nothing else to do. And we sat there for about two hours. And then he came out a bit later and, and uh, he gave each of one of us a boat ticket. In down in the hold on the f sort of fourth class Chandra's line ship that was going to Acapulco, right? Like, so we were elevated to a boat ticket, and other people, I don't know what they felt. <laughs> they were a bit delevated. <laughs> we were elevated, and they were delevated. And, and, uh, and then he gave us five dollars each, and because the boat was leaving in ten days, and the five dollars was for us to live on um, until the boat left. And so, so, and then he jumped into a, somebody had gone and got a hire, I, I didn't know what was going on, somebody had hired a car for him. He, after giving us all this, he jumped in the hired car and disappeared. Right? And but we knew he was heading, heading for Rotorua, but we didn't know what Rotorua was. It's, you know, Rotorua is some kind of a lawnmower, a kind of a Rotorua. You know, in those days we had no idea, right? So we found out that Rotorua was a place and and Wonchuk and I together were we we were kind of penniless and we decided to hitchhike. Of course it was his birthday. We'll hitchhike to Rotorua so that we can say happy birthday to him. Because somehow we hadn't had time in all that fuffle to say happy birthday. And so we, we didn't know where he was, but we figured he'd be staying at a really good hotel. So we, we, we w walked out to, um, what is it, Whakarewanaewa, and the Geyserland Hotel. We, f we made a guess he'd be out there. And on the way, you know, you go out that, that Boulevard Avenue, and, and there are all these um, flowers, right, like flower beds all through there. And we, we had absolutely nothing to give him, so we, we picked some flowers, you know, and... and uh, um, you know, and we kind of found out where he was, asked him, yeah, and knocked on his door, and and uh, we were saying, you know, happy birthday, sir, and he looked at us like, uh, <laughs> right? He said, dead flowers. <laughs> Thank you. Close the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started thinking about all those flowers, those dead flowers that were being offered to the Tathagatas, kind of warehouses, like maybe, I suppose a warehouse of dead flowers is called a compost heap, <laughs> you know, and I figured out that the Buddha wasn't really interested in dead flowers. <laughs> Right? And it's symbolizing flowering, uh, flowerings. You know, it's like a, it's unfolding, bodhi, buds, right? And so think of beautiful flowerings, flowerings of body, flowerings of speech, flowerings of mind, right? And networks of flowerings, you know? In other words, like a flowering of body, speech, and mind, networking with another flowering body, speech, of mind into, if you like, a thing we call an understanding or a description or a sense of implication, a story that we make about the universe, right? They're, it's built out of flowerings of body and speech and mind, my flowerings of body, speech and mind, and the, my culture's flowerings of body, speech and mind, and we flower forth this idea of biology evolving. Wow, out of nothing, right? It's just like together we are birthing these flowerings of, of beauty. To me, is like beautiful flowerings. is is like a sense of um, kind of right harmony. A thing is beautiful because it has a kind of a. It feels to me to reverberate a sense of right harmony. And and so you know, in this sense, beauty doesn't have anything to do with style or glamour or, or um, you know, trends, social trends. Well, it, it does have something to do with the social trend because that can affect our perception of what's harmonious or not, right? It doesn't 
doesn't cause it, but it affects it. Okay? But this is how you can look at something and go, oh, it just, and to see something like, like it, it's so beautiful, it stops your breath, right? Why, right? It's a sense of like blessing in the beauty, right? This is like, like just this moment of like deeper harmony with a larger universe. You know, whether you see it in a person, whether you see it in an action, whether you see it in a, a form that's been created, right? And so here, this is what we're doing. We're, we're learning how to, my life as beautiful flowerings and our lives as networks of flowerings, easeful communication, right? Like, like interchange with others in ways that, that, that supports a sense of ease rather than a sense of kind of tension, agitation. Right? And the balm of healing presence, right? To be, I'm here for you, right? To really be here. Th this is the offering. This is, this is implicit in a vision of, a, of a, a completely interdependent, evolving mystery biosphere, right? Tathagata in action. Okay? Canopies of shelter and refuge. And um, that's what canopies, you know, like a tent kind of thing or a big umbrella. That's when you're offering canopies. It's actually um, symbolic of refuge, right? But you think of refuge, it's like, um, uh, it's like a shelter that keeps you safe, right? And so, uh, so in a sense, it might have quite firm specific kinds of walls like for example if you want to be sheltered from the rain it's good to have a kind of roof that's not permeable to rain you know like a fishing net doesn't make a great roof in terms of keeping the rain off right whereas sheet metal does right if you're living in a place where there's really really strong winds right your shelter might want to have really thick brick walls. Okay. Now you see, you, you're, you're, you're sometimes creating shelter by um, the shelter. You can be inside it or outside it. Can you see this, right? We're talking about building walls here. <laughs> We're talking about building walls here. It's not just lovey-dovey total open, vulnerable, smash down. We're talking about skillful building of walls. That's what a refuge is. It's temporary. It's temporary in a sense you don't need um, a refuge from the rain when it's not raining. You only need the refuge when it's raining. But the thing is, is that we stay in the refuge against raining on sunny days, right? And our, our, our idea of housing has become so deeply part of our sense of being that most of us would say, describe what's happening right now as being outside. How weird. Mm. It, it, you think like before, <laughs> except for snails and, 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 and other creatures that you know, I mean, there's lots of other creatures. There's, there's some that build walls, like snails, right? But then there's lots of creatures that will take shelter when shelter's needed. But then when shelter's not needed, they don't take it. I take my refuge until enlightenment is reached. In the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, I take my refuge until enlightenment is reached. Ah, okay, enlightenment now. Don't need Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. They're just concepts, right, to help me to a place, right, of being, a way of being. Okay? And so sometimes, for example, and I'm, I'm, I'm making, a, I'm belaboring this point because I'm trying to address something which I'm sure many of us have been wrestling with over the last few days, right? Um, you know, this, this, I think, glorious vision, right, of, of interbeingness, interknowingness, right? And then this, like, very real, upsetting, difficult question of what do you do with guys like that person who, 
who shot all those people in Christchurch. Right? How do you deal with him in a way that he doesn't deal with you? How do you deal with him without hating? How do you deal with him without being expressions of that? Huh? And, and for me, I can see hints at this. Like we are, our aspiration is to, first of all, you know, following the, the um, advice of the Bodhisattva Augustine, right? Um, love and doest thou wilt, right? You know, or paraphrased by Tarchin, right? Be in a state of love and do the best you can. Because right? right? I figure that's all we're doing when we wilt, right? <laughs> to love and ask thou wilt. <laughs> right? And so, you know, canopies of shelter, like who's being sheltered? Maybe there's a place in this, maybe it is a point of refuge for life and unfolding that might require that we place some people in the house. Mm -hmm while well, we can live outside the house. It's called prison. Now, now, now I'm, I'm not trying to make a, a simplistic excuse for prison systems, but I'm trying to open the door for a, a different avenue of contemplation about this, right? Like what, could we see this whole sense of how do we, like that aspect of kind of controlling or policing, not punishing, Right? I mean, and then, and then in the house, do everything you can to, to supply as much kind of therapy and, mm -hmm. and support and, and uh, so on, so that the being can um, find their way back to the interbeingness that began them, right? At which point you can open the doors and let them out, right? But, but uh, um, you know, it, it just seems to me that it's, it's kind of given that you, if somebody's running around with a knife stabbing everyone in sight, um, you, you have, I mean, it makes sense to immobilize them. It makes sense to take the knife away from them, even though they don't want it to be taken away from them. It makes sense to take their guns away from them, right? But like in the context, like for, I think for some Buddhists, that, that part becomes awkward, mm. right? Because it feels like a, but like expand this. What do we mean by refuge and who is the refuge for? Is it a refuge for me or is it a refuge for all beings? Is it a refuge for the safety of our community, for the well-being of our community? And, and refuge, and as I say, refuge is, um, is always temporary. I take my refuge until enlightenment is reached. I take my refuge from the rain until the storm has passed. Right? I take my refuge, I create a refuge or a space or a, 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 a distinction and a separation between myself and this being until no longer is this distinction needed. And you might say, yeah, but you're making a choice and foisting it on others. Well, yes, you have to make a choice. Choices have been made throughout evolution, and, and you live the consequences. You know, in a sense, the enlightened being is one who's able to take responsibility for the choices that they make. In other words, be willing to live with the implications of the actions that they engage in. Right? And so we do the best we can. So I'm just trying to, you know, in a sense, we're not saying um, you're, you know, you're offering support to the bodhisattva in each and every being. You're not, in a sense, making offerings to the nastiness of each being. You're like to make offerings is to augment. You know what I mean? Like so, you're this. This is this process of. I'm giving to the giving nature of beings, right? You're augmenting giving. I'm, I'm, you know, you're augmenting these qualities that go hand in hand with what we call a well-functioning, interdependent community, interbeing, interknowing, right? And and I think, I mean, I can make a good argument um, case, right? For 
uh, this being more sustainable in the long haul, right? And, and, and the basis of my argument is to say, well, that's actually the process that's taken us for four billion years up until now. And so I got a hunch. It's, it's, it's sort of proved its track record. It's pretty good. Um, and, and then you see, well, wh where, where are the, the forces of destruction? Well, that asteroid came down and smashed up, and there was the fourth great extinction or whatever. The planet was sort of wiped back to single cell life, and then it grew forward again. And so I say, oh, well, that's interesting. Like, the result of that negativity was intense but brief, and meanwhile, the interconnectedness just keeps rolling on, right? And, and comes to a massive flowering, and then there's a kind of a shakedown, and then there's a massive flowering, and a shakedown. We, we happen to be the universe observing itself in a period of shakedown. Right? Um, how wonderful that we can have the experience of being the universe observing itself. <laughs> because there's lots of beings that are being shaken down and they don't have any sense of it at all, right? So. Beautiful flowerings and networks of flowerings, easeful communication and the balm of healing present, canopies of shelter and refuge. You know, do I, do I restrain myself or restrain some other person out of anger? Or do I restrain myself or some other person out of um, love and compassion for the larger um, community? Right? And, and you can, the analysis can say, yeah, but that kind of negative side was in there. But that's your, your mo Like, I don't, do you kill animals to destroy them? Right? Or do you, in a sense, reluctantly kill animals to eat them and value their food and give thanks to that and aspire to use that energy to bring forth more beauty into the world. To me, there's a difference in that. In, in the, for the animal, probably, they might say, well, I don't care. <laughs> I'm just as dead. <laughs> right? But in a sense, like, you're, you can live with... It. I've met, I've, I know people who, who are lifelong dedicated hunters, right, who are far more compassionate and having feeling about the world than an awful lot of kind of vegetarian Buddhists I've met, right? They're deeply connected. They have a huge respect for it. They don't, and they use all of the animal, and they, um, and they're not, I'm not talking about ancient times. I can't. I'm not an ancient time. I'm talking about now. I'm referring to people I've met up in, in, um, uh, Baffin Island, you know, Inuit people, right? Um, people who are going out hunting whales, right? And we ended up being part of a whale hunt. We thought we were going whale watching, but they thought, oh, well, seeing how these tourists are paying for the petrol, we might as well kill a whale while we're out here. <laughs> right? That was a shock. <laughs> right? <laughs> And they come back, and we come back with this 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 uh, beluga whale, and 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 you know the whole village is out there excited, and they share the meat amongst all the households and all the blubber and everything. It's like, you know, and they shared it with us. They brought us one a great big huge bowl of of um, raw whale blubber, <laughs> white, thick, lardy. Right? Can you remember? Or did they deep no, fry it or something? No, 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 no. It was raw because that was the delicacy. Yeah, yeah. And this was the, this was the super delicacy, right? <laughs> and they, they, they brought this for us, and, and we all, oh, oh, thanks, very nice. You know, tried to be kind of polite. You know, you had to have some, right? And, and, then, uh, and then, you know, one of the little kids, one of the boys from the village was kind of wandering around our campsite. And we thought, oh, you know, poor guy out here. You know, we'd, we'd flown in tons of, of uh, lettuces and tomatoes and, you know, for our, <laughs> for our salads and things like that, right? We thought, oh, he's probably starved for something. He just loved, we'll give him a special treat. So we, we gave him some salad. And 
he picked up his lettuce leaf and looked like it like it was a piece of muktuk, right? M muktuk's whale blubber, right? Only me looking at the muktuk, it was him looking at the, the, the lettuce. And then he put it in his mouth. And, and this hot look of just absolute <laughs> disgust came in, and he spat it out, <laughs> right? So, so we thought we were offering the delica our delicacy to him, and he was offering his delicacy to us, right? But the, but the, the point is, it's like they had a way of, uh, they were generous people, they were engaged, they're looking at the, their relationship, they're trying to live well together, right? Um, that's and and that's we live in contradictions we we ha we have to in a sense find a way of explaining the universe that gives integrity to our action and doing that in such a way that the sustainability of all life is supported <laughs> right you could you could be a kind of a small fringe kind of radical hate group or something and you're feeling an integrity to your attitude <laughs> to your action when you're surrounded by your buddies right but it fails on the point of contributing to the larger sustainability of life because we, we we can't just judge what we do in our immediate little surround right how, how does my meditation support life like what can I do well I can offer the best of my, um, the, the, the outflow of the demonstration of my knowing of interbeingness is to share my best with beings. Beautiful flowerings and networks of flowerings, easeful communication and the balm of healing present, canopies of shelter and refuge, lamps of clear seeing and deep understanding. You know, it, we may this may become a practice for us. We might spend like, you know, months really working on clarifying our seeing and what is to clear seeing and what is understanding and bringing it forth more and more and more and more. And that's our, that's our meditation. Or somebody else is one who's building shelter, you know, affordable homes, right? Going, you know, you work for an for a NGO and fly into cyclone hit poor countries and help reconstruct um, uh, houses, you know, after they've all, you know, cheap but efficient and, and kind of ecologically functional, right? This is, this is to do with, this is providing refuge. And lots of people don't make a distinction, like they don't, they don't see the connection between this kind of refuge and, and sitting in front of a Buddha statue going, I take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha. You know, like, oh, that's refuge, refuge, and this is just a house, merely. But this is actually when you don't have a house and you need it, actually, that's more important to you, right? When you don't have food, that's more important to you. Right? And so these are all, like, different like body, speech, and mind. Don't We don't want to just kind of put a value judgment and say, well, mind things are where it's really profound. but working out our offerings at the bodily level is just mundane. Right? No, they're equal. All the way through, they flow through each other. Right? I offer to all beings who are awakening to or abiding as. Right? So, you know, in a sense, this is talking about beings who are dwelling in realization, you know, Tathagatas, and beings who are um, Tathagatas in process of being transformed from being worms <laughs> in cocoons, Tathagata Garba, right, which we can begin to recognize in everyone, right, um, offering to all those abiding as the flow of primordial, ever fresh, multi leveled, multi domain dancing responsiveness. That's what awareness is, right? And it's ever fresh. It's always happening now. There's no other place for it to be happening, right? It's ever fresh. With the clothing of harmonious thought forms, right? Now this is this is actually oddly enough, the clothing of harmonious thought forms is part of the gharba, right? I'm, I was suddenly struck today that that uh, you know English being an Indo-European language, gharba is not Tibetan. It's Sanskrit. 
and and it, I'm I'm betting anything that there's a connection between talking about my garb mm. and garpa, mm. right? It it means covering. It means womb in the sense that it covers. You know, I mean, it's an, an ancient. It's like seeing a basic principle of something being covered by other things. And it's interesting how that reflected right through into our English word that we use today. Not so often, but we can talk about one's garb, right? And garments, right, that we have here. And so, in a sense, we cover the mystery of interbeing with, with concepts and theories, with thought forms, with understandings, you know, in a sense like, and so to the point where we can't see the real thing because all we see is the wrapping right and so what you see is what the observer can see but you don't see what the experience experiences within itself so we all we see is ever from the perspective of observer all of our experience is from the perspective of observer and yet we may begin to intuit that this experience which is the perspective of the observer is coming from a generative process that involves everything and everyone throughout evolving time, right, which is now here, right, which is actually giving rise to this experience, but I can't see because it's covered in my, all the things that I use to explain what it is I'm seeing. Oh yeah, this evolutionary thing that's moving through. <laughs> it's so close and yet so far away, you know, in this sense. So with the clothing of harmonious thought forms, this is instead of the clothing of disharmonious thought forms, like hate sites on the social media, you know, like, like just the standard news. <laughs> it's like we're kind of clothing the world and in, in constantly clothing it in, in various thought forms. Right? And this is an aspiration to offer. You see, here it is. is this is actually offering robes. In kind of, that's, that's actually what you read in the text. You offer a whole stack of robes, which is kind of okay if you're into robes. But, but uh, you know, imagine the bodhisattva who worked in the stock exchange. They go, well, thanks. What am I going to do with all this? And drop them off at the op shop. <laughs> right? But the robes represented thought forms. Right? Then harmonious thought. Can I have concepts and understandings, again, which are supportive of a deepening engagement with this process, rather than understandings and thought forms which distance me and gradually delude me into thinking that I'm completely separated from it? And this is, you know, the, in a sense, the clothing of harmonious thought forms has got so refined, so harmonious, that uh, it's like the child looks at the emperor and says, Samantha Bhadra has no clothes. <laughs> right? It's like, this is naked awareness, right? Not some mysterious thing, naked awareness in the middle of everything, but it's like, um, the, the, the awareness nature of everything, the dancing responsiveness at myriad levels and so on, this is aware of the ocean of awareness in action, nakedly seen. And the exquisite perfume of devotion, sense of being devoted to love and devoted to truth and devoted to honesty and devoted to giving it your best shot and devoted to forgiveness and devoted to, right? This is just like a colossal aspiration to, to um, strengthen your intent to live in a really positive way with body, speech, and mind. This is my offering. With activities that beautify the body of manifestation and a measureless array of wonderfully inspiring qualities, that part was just added to fill in all the things that you thought were left out. <laughs> <coughs> and to also cover the things that haven't yet evolved into the universe. And that way the, the text gets to be valuable for later on. 
I think, oh, how prescient, right? That how, how did they know about this? <laughs> I knew there were a measureless array of wonderfully inspiring qualities. I make offerings. Excuse me. Of water. <clears throat> I make offerings to all these beings dwelling in the realm of spontaneous liberation. Okay? Liberation is not dwelling in the realm of belabored, effortful liberation. Right? Each moment self liberates. We begin to see this. Like when if a person experiences liberation, it wasn't because they did it, it was because the universe danced away in a certain way and it was described by the observer, oh, this is oh, liberated. Right? This is, it's spontaneous in the sense that it's, it's, um, it's not contrived by any individual player. Right? It's the, it's the communal action. Right? We, we, if we have a if we have a really very, very healthy society, right, with just a small amount, a uh, dose of negativity to give it a, a, to help seed the production of the pearl, because oysters that don't have negativity don't make pearls, right? So you kind of the bodhisattva, in a sense, like part of the training and the involvement of the bodhisattva is, is holding the question, how do I deal with this kind of negativity? But generally, look at the balance. You know, you got massive society, which is like flowing in wholesome relationship, a little bit of negativity, right? Actually, there'd be spontaneous awakening all over the lot. Huh? Giftings incomparable and vast, continuously arising in the world of my own knowing, in the spacious play of my own knowing, I joyfully offer to all awakening ones. Right? So this, this, this is a yoga right here. It's just one of just offering, offering, offering. This is Dana Parami gone big time. It, it was already there way back at the beginning when we touched on the six Parami. Right? These themes go all the way, but they're getting kind of richer and fuller and so on. By the power of my faith in wholesome activity, my faith and trust that all activity is an expression of the dynamic of the whole. I'm confident of that. By the power of my faith and confidence in that, I, I bow to and pay respects to all these victorious ones. And that's the one time I used the word victorious ones. Right? I figured I had to kind of make some gesture to the tradition. And as I've pointed out many times before, you know, that, that uh, you know, I wrestled with victorious ones, trying to make it meaningful to me. Right? Because, I, you know, to me, victor was too victorious over something, you know, like you're going to, like the, you win the battle and you're the victor. And, and, uh, and it wasn't until I just struck me one day out of the blue that victor sounded, was, was probably having something to do with victim, you know. And so I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm not going to wrestle with this victor business. I'm mean, like, what, what is a victim? You know, what is it? feel like, to feel like a victim. And, and it struck me that to be a victim, you, you essentially, you can be all kinds of vic victims of all kinds of situations and circumstances. So, but, but the similarity between all of them is stuff is done to you, right? Yeah. right? And, and I began to see how, you know, in a Buddhist sense, you know, we could, you know, generally we, we call a victim negative stuff is done to you, or stuff is done to you that you don't want done to you. That's, that's like to be a victim, right? It's, it's forced on you, right? Um, but then I thought, well, in a Buddhist system, you know, they, they also have positive victims, right? So that's the person who said, oh, the blessing happened to me, right? The light descended on me, 
right? And so you, you sort of get really involved. You, you really want to be a victim, but you want to be a positive victim. You know, pray, bless me, do something. You know, I was sitting there in meditation and suddenly I was engulfed in this cosmic consciousness. It was fantastic, right? So one, I wish it would happen again, you know? And, you know, my meditation after that is like just sitting there wishing it would happen again and getting frustrated because it isn't. That's, that's, that's the practice of meditation. And, and in other words, like it happened to me. I have no idea how it happened. I don't feel that I participated in it. It came from God or from truth or a blessing or a wonderful moment or a epiphany or a, a peak experience or, you know, however you're going to kind of name the thing, right? But in a sense, it's similar in the sense that it happened to you outside your control. Huh? And then I was thinking, well, maybe if that's what a victim is, then maybe I could think in terms of a victor as being someone who not is in control, but someone who recognizes that it happens to me and I'm a participant. So that you have a feeling of being a player in it. At that point, I don't feel like being a victim anymore. Right? I can do something. I can push that person away that I don't want coming on to me. Right? Or I can, um, I can recognize that, you know, because of my cultivation of sila, samadhi, and prajna, and because of the way the, the, um, you know, my aspiration to deepen focus and come into samadhi, that that was my way, my contribution to the arising of this beautiful blessing of the universe. And so instead of sitting there wishing for the blessing of the universe and don't know what to do, I cultivate what I know I can do. I, I mean, whether or not the other players in this experience cooperate, that's beyond me. I can't do anything about that. But I can do what I can do. I can, I'm, I can offer my positivity. Okay? And, you know, we live in a, a distorted world. We live in a difficult world where we feel that offering our positivity is not good enough. Yeah, but my, I could offer positivity, but the world's still going to hell in a basket. Um, you know, and it's like, is it really working? Is it worth anything? There's something tragic about that, you know, because it's like, it feels good in your being to feel good in your being, like it feels good in your being to offer goodness, right? And, and so, you know, the Dalai Lama said, look, if you can't do it for others, at least do it for yourself, right? If you can't be interested in others, then cultivate enlightened self-interest, right? And if you do that deeply and profoundly, you'll realize that it's in your self-interest that the people around you are happy because you feel a lot better when you're surrounded by happy people than when you're surrounded by miserable people. And therefore, not for their benefit at all, <laughs> right? For your own greedy guts, individual selfish interest, right? Help all sentient beings, <laughs> right? Who cares how you explain it? Just do it, right? But you might come to a way where that's not the kind of explanation that makes sense to you. And you begin to realize there's something really I don't mean joyful, fun, fun, fun. I mean deeply nourishing and good and right and me meaningful, right, to be engaged in good work. It's, it's very beautiful to have a sense of some kind of acknowledgement that this work is appreciated or what have you, but that's a different thing, right? It's just that in the, in the giving, it's there. So this is the second um, training, right? First of all, we're training to recognize the Tathagata nature of everyone, which implies the interbeing, interdependent nature of everyone, right? I mean, it's, you can't have a realization of Tathagata without a realization of interdependence. That they're, they're just different, different viewings of the same kind of um, domain or dynamic, right? And then, and then, so I'm training in that because until I can see that interbeingness, 
the kind of um, confidence that such a positive flow of offering as being a valuable and sane and skillful way of proceeding doesn't arise. Because if I see, you know, if, if I see, well, we're all, you know, we uh, kind of white males, privileged guys are interdependent and we're, we're buddies and we hang out with each other. You cover my back, I cover your back, we're interdependent, right? And everybody else is an enemy, right? And then, okay, so now I know interdependent nature, I understand that, and now my activity rolls out from that. Well, we could shoot all those people and we could persecute these people and we could stake out our land and raise up our flag and build our barricade and um, live in a little male heaven. Weird, right? I'd imagine, imagine if they really all got together with the people they really valued, right? I mean, most of the vociferous um, exponents, if you like, of this kind of um, hate behavior are white male, um, on a global scale, privileged um, people. Right? I so say, okay, we'll make a little heaven for you, and you can all get together and stay in your little heaven. And then we can sit out, I'll run a little bedding shop on the outside of how sustainable this is. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, they might need the odd female. Okay. But then, of course, they've got that in mind anyway, and then they'd have them, but they're called slaves. I'm being terribly gross because it's terribly gross. Mm. Okay. And we can see that, in a sense, I can't work with this. Um, I can't. I can't use that mindset to, you know. People are saying, you know, I've read lots in the news about people saying, well, you know, terrorism is on the rise, and we have to study that. And some people were saying we've got to study the methods of ISIS in order to combat ISIS. I mean, I'm going, hmm, this is seriously down the tube. Okay. And, and so this first step here is like, this is kind of um, a recognition. I know we're all in this together. It's not a theory. And I know that um, my aspiration is to give my best in every area. If I have a deep understanding of, you know, Buddhist stuff, that's part of my gift. If I have a, an understanding of dance and theater, that's my gift. If I have an understanding of, of um, uh, midwifery, that's my gift. It's not my only gift, but you know, in, in a sense, we, we, there's myriad gifts that this could flow out through. You know, you could be a counselor, you could be an organizer, you could help people with their economic planning. Right? So, I mean, there's people who are, you know, just being helped. Poor people who are taken advantage of by loan sharks. And, and uh, um, you know, and they're being helped by Salvation Army helps out with, a, with an accountant, right? Who just shows them how to budget enough so that by the end of the week they can still feed their kids and it hasn't gone off on something else. And, I mean, these are practical skills, right? Which are actually helping. Uh, um, at the level that people are able to receive help, right? Other beings are able to receive help at other levels, and we, we in a sense, give according to our capacity to give, and we give to beings who have the capacity to receive that, right? Um, and probably we can't do every giving for everyone from one person. Right? The universe is too big, right? And so we have to come to an integrity and a, and a sense of nothing lacking that I give where my life giving gives and not worried about not giving in the areas where my life giving isn't giving, you know, because I don't have the opportunity. 
it's hard for me to do something meaningful for now for, for the millions of people who are just just suffering like crazy in Mozambique and Zimbabwe, right? With these massive, well, from cyclone and massive flooding and so on, and whole cities wiped out, you know? I mean, I can give a little bit of money to Oxfam and, um, you know, because anything I give, we could sell a house, it's still a little bit of money to a thing like that. It's, it's nothing, you know? Um, you do what little bits you can do. If you're there on the ground, you can do more. If I was in Christchurch, right, I would walk, right, to the, to the mosque or to the wherever and meet people. And, but I'm not, I'm here and we're doing this. You do what you can do, right? And, and eventually you start to have a, a respect and a dignity for doing what you can do. And gradually your doing becomes more and more an expression of bodhisattva yana. There's Mahayana, right? We, we start off and it's like, it's, it's like, this is what I can do and this is what I can do. This is what I can do. This is what I can do. It's, it's, it's expanding out in all directions from yourself and stabilizing and solid in this, right? Eventually, this is just, we're only two into it. We've got another five to go, right? This is a school, this is a training. Of course, of course, we work with it all, all at the same time, right? And not only that, but sometimes you work with this, people work with this quite meaningfully for themselves. Um, you know, in the first year that they meet with Dharma. This is presented almost as like a finishing school for Samantha Bhadra ship, right? Um, but we can actually have a lot of meaning in this at all sorts of different levels. Right? Are there any thoughts or questions? Otherwise, you're probably wondering how on earth we're going to get through this text. Mm -hmm. There's only two more classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. <laughs> It's, wondering is great. Wondering is a very beautiful state. <laughs> I too am wondering. We can wonder together. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Blessing. Uh. <laughs> Any thoughts, sir? Hmm? Yeah. Um, the phrase clothing of harmonious thought forms. Yes. And what how you've spoken to that and spoken with that today. So um, in previous days you did <coughs> you say familiarize myself. Familiarize yourself. I've heard that repeated. Yes. So um, well, it, there's, you, I, you do have to finish the f thing, familiarize, not familiarize yourself, but familiarize yourself with, I yes. did, there was a with, with that. So, yeah. I'm thinking that, for example, the class itself, the retreat, but then the class, is such a, a focus of these thought forms, mm, yeah. harmonious ones, Yes. and <coughs> that quality of focus isn't there for me for the 24 hours throughout the day, mm -hmm. more so when I'm in, here in the retreat. Yeah. So I will reread some notes, I'll reread the sadhana, I'll do something or other, I'll sit. So I'm familiarizing myself so that it's sort of becoming familiar. It's a clothing I'm going to wear. It's a fallback position. It's my default position if I become that familiar with these clothing of harmonious thought forms. I'm following you, but, I, but, but I'd like to suggest a slightly different angle on what I think you're saying, you know, and, and instead of seeing 
you know, you're from, it's, it's as if you're saying you're familiarizing yourself with this clothing of harmonious thought forms, and that's, mm -hmm. I, that seems to me, quite legitimate way of looking at it. Sadhana. Yeah, in the whole sadhana. Yeah. But <clears throat> imagine familiarizing yourself with the, the feeling of being and what contributes to that when these harmonious thought forms are being thought. Like, in other, in other words, I'm, I'm, we're familiarizing with what's inside the clothing. What's inside, what's inside the clothing, not, not what's, the, not the clothing. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, uh, that I'm, I'm not correcting what you're saying. I'm just, I'm just expanding it or, or making a, a kind of a, a further subtle dimension of it. Um, the familiarizing with the sadhana and the, the harmonious clothing of thought forms, so on, of a, of a sadhana or a teaching, or, or the actually the sadhana here is just a, it's just a very brief, um, poetic attempt to hint at this vast teaching called Mahayana. If if you're if you were to study um, Mahayana teaching and Madhyamaka philosophy and all the different schools of it, which there's no need for you to do, unless you're interested, right? Um, you would see that the whole thing is reflected in the sadhana. Uh, some of it by very tiny little hints and so on, but it's all there, right? Um, if you if you were to you know, sometimes I think if I were, this commentary I'm writing on the sadhana, if I, if I expand it out as far as I can expand it, it's going to turn into a like 400 page book. You know, it'll be huge. Um, um, so you're familiarizing with that. And so you, if that's something it feels um, exciting or valuable or interesting, you know what I mean? So, so part of our familiarization is to be involved with what does that. So you're involved by coming to class every day, you know? And, and I think of like how many years I spent in the early days um, traveling with Rinpoche. I heard it again and again and again, you know? And, and uh, so I had kind of seven years of, of sitting in on zillions of classes because I was helping out and so but people would come and go and I'm always there you know just hearing all these different classes and so on and then the thing is that my nature is such or my, my conditioning or my temperament is that if you would make even the slightest hint at you know you know oh in this text or in that text I'd get the text and read the text he never looked at it but I'd read the text and then I want to read other texts you know for example interested in Satipatthana so it wasn't enough for me just to have his little mimeographed handout of the Satipatthana it wasn't enough to have Tarchin's meditation you know, manual for meditators you know I'd want to know Joseph Goldstein's book on Satipatthana and, 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 and Jack uh, Cornfield's book on Satipatthana, Achan Cha's book on Satipatthana, and then I want to know the Vasudhi Magon, just because my interest was like really taking me into this, but all of them were acting as kind of secondary reminders mm. of the effect of, so that, you know, after I left from, I mean, in a sense, like, I was with Rinpoche a lot for seven years, and then after that it was increasingly less, until eventually, you know, maybe, maybe for another 10 years, I'm just making a guess without, it might be my <coughs> memory of it is, gets vague at this, you know, maybe I'd see him for like a third of the year, right? And the rest of the time I was teaching. And then, and then eventually I was, for the rest of the time, I'd see him maybe for a few days every two years or something, that, that's all, right? So, um, actually it wasn't, I wasn't at a stage where my familiarization with these thought forms was strong enough, right, to go, oh, well, that's all I need. It wasn't, right? Um, so I borrowed from, I had to be reminded by others. And in fact, I felt I needed to be reminded so, con so often and so frequently that it just seemed totally unreasonable to expect that any human being would dedicate themselves to being my reminder. 
you know, because I needed to be reminded every single day, many times a day. So, you know, for me, you know, I, not everyone has this, and I'm not saying they should or anything, but I'm for, I count it a blessing for me that, that, that as I say, I have a natural kind of connection with written word, uh, with books. And so I study, and I study, and I study, and, I, and everything's feeding into this. And although it seems like I study an incredibly wide range of disciplines, you know, biology, geology, astrophysics, um, um, you know, Sufism, Christianity, and so on, while I'm reading them, I'm, I'm not actually studying them. I'm just taking the kind of the, the glimpses of vision, different kinds of angles on these themes that I'm interested in, which is being expressed here, and, and enriching the view from all these different sides, which also makes it, increases the potential of a facility to talk to others about this um, without having to resort to Buddhism. Right? And so my familiarization with it gets stronger and stronger and stronger until sort of one day you wake up and it goes, duh, I live this. It's like, you know, it wasn't sort of like there was this, the light goes on and now you're authenticated or something and, you know, there was, you weren't and then you were. It was kind of like, you know, yeah, I guess, actually, this is, this is my life. And you and you real and everything then becomes more and more like every being you meet becomes a reminder, right? So now, like now, all your meetings, all your involvements, all your interactions are reminding you of interconnectedness because you see the interconnectedness everywhere, rather than oh wow we're all interconnected, <laughs> and then you look around and in this disconnected world, right? So the actual living, you know, you begin to see it in your living. And then, and then it really starts to take off. Then you realize, oh, I'm finally, you know, I just, you know, I, I really get this image of multiple lifetimes to, to fully realize um, these, this magnificence, if you like, of the Dharma Dhatu. Because here I am, 50 years of involvement with Dharma, and I, I'm, I am, I really feel I'm starting to get it. I really am. And I kind of, if I if I had this 50 years ago, so I had 50 years then to unfold it and actually learn how to, the implications of what that would be, then I could really do something, you know? And, I, and, I, and so ever since, yeah, I, I can see how it's probably always, you're in it for the long haul, right? And, and so the, the familiarizing, we need to make effort one way or another if we, it doesn't just happen, right? In a sense, I was a victim of Namjal. You know, in other words, I'd, I'd plunk myself down in the room with him and he would happen to me. <laughs> you know, like he was his own person, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, and so, and that was a positive victim, you know, in a sense, like I was a positive victim. I got, I got uh, inspired to bodhisattva ship. Like, why, how would a kind of middle class, Don Mills raised, you know, um, Canadian, right, meet with the Lotus Sutra? <laughs> you know, unless somebody comes and introduces, you know, I mean, the Lotus Sutra wasn't in the local library. <laughs> you know what I mean? The Awatamsaka Sutra, you know? Bodhisattva, the concept. I mean, you've got to meet a weirdie to even meet with Bodhisattva, <laughs> right? So it just happened to me, you know, for, because of Malcolm, my, my friend who <laughs> dragged me off. And, and, uh, and so, but gradually, I became a participant. And I participated in my learning instead of just, in a sense, receiving as if I can only receive it from this teacher. And I began, it's not, it's not to denigrate or diminish the importance of various teachers. It's more to augment the recognition of the teacherliness of so many other beings and contributors to our life and seeing how it all weaves together. And later on in this, I hope we get to it, 
<laughs> right? We see that this kind of attitude, the Bodhisattva training, takes us to encouraging this in others. Okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> so, by the power of these wholesome activities, may our lives be rich with awakening. May our lives be rich with awakening. Our lives are rich with awakening. Living thus, may we abandon all fragmentation, all unholing trends. Right? Through the endless mystery of life, may we help all beings to realize their true tathagata, interbeing, interknowing nature, Sarvamangalam. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm.